Hello, I'm Mr. Sinolit, aka Wenxue Shenzhen. Welcome to Sinolit. Last time we looked at what the exam was like in the provincial examination. We looked at those pokey little cells that you were in, so you were in one of those at the end of the last video. And we're going to find out what you had to do as a candidate to become a civil servant, because you couldn't even become one yet. You'd only passed the provincial examination. You had certain status by passing this, of course, but there was no job by default for you yet. No, you'd only pass stage two. If you're lucky enough to pass this exam, you'd become a Juan, so you'd pass the provincial exam. But if you wanted to go on higher, then maybe it was a metropolitan exam. And that would have also been a three-day exam. And then if you wanted to go higher than that, if you really wanted to aim high, there was the final palace exams and people passing this would have become the Jin Shu, the most highly sought examinations level passes got these. So for example, a poet I've looked at, He Jiang, who wrote on returning home. You can see my video. Well, if you want to know more about that poet, um, link in the description here. If you want to know more about that, he passed the Jin Shu exams. Oh, ho, ho, but that's not all. You may have memorized all of the text. You may be a brilliant poet. You may be able to remember all the summaries, all the commentaries, be able to do this three day marathon pass. That's not all. You are just one of millions of candidates, according to estimates by Miyazaki, the writer of this book during the Qing dynasty. The competition level was through the roof. You had tiny fractional chance of passing, even if you were brilliant. With two million candidates taking every exam, taking the exam every year at the lowest level, you really were under the cosh of pressure to pass the exam. No wonder this book lists a number of rebellions caused by people who couldn't pass the exam, including Hong Shouquan, the leader of the Taiping Rebellion, I've done a book review on that called Heavenly, uh, Autumn in the Heavenly Kingdom, if you want to know more about that. This exam sent people mad sometimes. And no wonder, because I haven't even got to the marking process yet. Now, just like you, the examiners had to stay in the compound for the entirety of the time they marked the papers. They couldn't leave until all of them were marked. And before they'd even started marking them, a team of hundreds of script writers would copy your answer papers in black ink to make sure that no one could know that your handwriting could be connected to you. So corruption, cheating was stopped by this. So you'd already had your entire papers answered copied by hand before they'd even got into the examiner's hand. There were also other methods they used to stop people cheating. One thing they did was to ask you to come back a few days after the exam and write down the first 14 lines of, the first of one of the questions from your memory. That was to make sure at least you said you are who you say you are and that you were the person in the exam. They had many other uh, methods as well. They would write down on the back of each uh, paper on a corresponding number to which you were assigned some features, of facial features they would write down. So they had some sort of identification system like we and haven't even got to the marking process yet. So remember, we have a set load of text and summaries and commentaries for which you are examined on, your memory of them. This isn't exactly encouraging free thought. Many answers would have been very similar. So how to tell them apart? Well, standardized handwriting, making sure you follow the prescribed rules, like for example we talked about earlier, not writing the emperor's uh, characters in a normal manner, raising them above the text and making them special. Th things like this, uh, tiny little things would have been picked up upon by the examiners. To tell apart candidates, remember thousands of candidates they would have had to mark. Can you imagine 
the tiresomeness of this process. Reading answers again and again on the same questions day after day. In fact, Miyazaki here writes that great calligraphers in Chinese history would not have passed this exam because their writing was not standardised enough. Even more than this, if you're lucky enough to get to the palace exam, if you're lucky enough to pass all the exams before this, at every stage, and never get caught for doing anything wrong, even by accident, then it was the emperor's decision in the end. Examiners might rank you very highly, but in one year there's an example of where there was an, an the imperial army marched through a province and it was decided by the emperor that on that year that province because it had uh, clothed and fed the army and spent more on them than others it was decided that it would be only fair that in that year a candidate from that province would be awarded number one and so much prestige going with that so in one year the ranked one person by the examiners was demoted down and the highest ranked person from that province was ranked up to number one. So all of these things had to go your way to pass the exam and be number one. And in spite of all of this, the exam system was seen as fair in general because these were started thousands of years ago over a thousand years ago, before even the Tang Dynasty in 700 AD. This is almost a thousand years, over a thousand years earlier than any exam system in Europe. But I definitely, I don't think I'd want to take this exam. I mean, the idea of spending three days in one of these cubicles with only three wooden boards, my papers and a brush and a curtain to keep myself warm, doesn't sound very appealing to me. How about to you? How about, would you like to stay three nights in these cubicles, surrounded by thousands of other sweaty, nervous students? I know I wouldn't. I can tell you, they were indeed, and sounded like hell. I've been Mr. Sign on it. Thank you very much for listening. Zai Jian.